Right. Then it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this NURA, the startup webinar hosted in collaboration with the Norwegian Cognitive Center here in Bergen, where we will fo focus on fish and AI. My name is Birte Hansen, and I work as the Innovation and Industry Coordinator in NURA. As part of my role, I also have the immense pleasure of coordinating NURA that startup, which is our innovation platform. NURA that startup is one of several initiatives within NURA. It is a national networking arena for and by the research and startup community in Norway within the fields of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and robotics. The main goal of Norad Startup is to build a knowledge-based innovation arena that facilitates networking and collaboration opportunities across the research and startup communities in Norway within the fields of AI, machine learning, and robotics. Nora, has, Nora a Startup focuses on the dissemination of knowledge and competence, which brings us to the webinar today. During this Nora that Startup event, we will explore exciting research conducted by researchers and innovative solutions pro provided by startups in the fishing industry in Norway. How can AI be used to automate fish counting, estimate fish species distribution, and predict fish behavior and welfare? We will soon find out. We, of course, encourage all of our participants to ask questions using the Q&A function and keep the discussion flowing in the chat. First up today, we have Sergei Budav, researcher at the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Bergen. Sergei, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Sergei. Now I will share my screen. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sergei. I'm working at the Theoretical Ecology Group. Well, our group is uh, uh, devoted to all kinds of theoretical, theoretical questions about link, how to link animals to the environment. And we have a smaller sub subgroup that is also interested in animal behavior, animal cognition, and animal decision making. Now I'll tr uh, talk about how to measure animal welfare and well-being and animal subjective internal state. Um, animal warfare is a uh, it, it's not new question but it's uh, getting very more and more important over time for practical and theoretical uh, and ethical uh, grounds first uh, animal welfare is uh, one of the major causes of mortality in fish it, poor, poor welfare uh, negatively affects fish growth uh, increase fish uh, feed waste Stress that is poor of uh, also inhibits uh, inhibits uh, immunity and makes fish susceptible to disease and parasites. And uh, one of the important questions, especially now, is focus on ethical consuming because consumers are now very concerned about how well are the fish feeling and how are the stress are they stressed or not? And the welfare is a uh, quite a complex question because uh, it can be anything. What can be made more easily is to answer uh, the state of pool welfare, that is stress. Stress is defined as a non-specific physiological behavioral cognitive state and response of the organism to cope with the real or anticipated challenges uh, and disturbances. And welfare generally concerns everything that uh, is about how the animal is uh, coping with its environment. And coping is how animal is having control over its bodily stability and mental uh, stability. For fish, mental, of course, uh, is not very well defined, but fish have cognition. And welfare is also uh, strongly linked with uh, health uh, and immunity. But generally, well being and welfare is. Uh, is a first person perspective. It's a first person question. It uh, requires understanding the animal internal state, the subjective feeling, and how animal actually feels. Uh, is it uh, feeling well or is it feeling badly? We, of course, can't ask fish about how it, is it stressed or not stressed, how it's feeling. We can't do anything like psychoanalysis of fish, but we can uh, do models. And with these models, we can 
assess the fish welfare using models. We can assess fish welfare. We can try to uh, predict uh, fish welfare in response to different perturbations or changes or anything else or in different environments. Or, and if we can assess and predict, we can basically control fish welfare at fish farms and in other environments. Um, models can be of different kinds. Uh, now it's quite common to uh, use uh, machine learning and deep learning models that's basically a statistical uh, black box requiring massive data. Uh, such approach may have some problems. There are very, very well known problems, like uh, they are very data hungry and uh, there are some problems with reliability. I this this uh, image just shows one of these classical examples of our unreliability in uh, machine learning uh, models. And there is also a big problem with uh, accountability and explainability because the black box model is difficult to interpret and difficult to understand why this or that prediction is made. We usually don't use this approach and we make causal mechanistic models. We try to uh, get available data from the fish literature or for animal behavior, even human behavior literature, and uh, build models uh, that make use of this, uh, uh, of real neurobiological and causal uh, mechanisms. Such models are easy, much easier to interpret, of course, and uh, they, these models also help to uh, develop theory because if we have something that is not predicted by the model, we need to change the theory and this change of the theory makes better model and this actually improves the theory also. Our models are uh, not just formulas or equations, but uh, a kind of autonomous agent models. We use a kind of uh, artificial life uh, approach. We make a whole fish organism, a virtual organism that is living in the virtual environment. And these uh, virtual fish make adaptive decisions based on the environment, the internal state, the expectations of the future. And what we are doing, is we are trying to build the digital fish. Uh, the parameters of these models are usually uh, adjusted and optimized uh, using evolutionary algorithms, uh, uh, range algorithms, and it has very close links to digital twin. What we are trying to, what is our ambition is to build a digital twin of fish that can be used for uh, fish farms. So we are trying to make a kind of digital laboratory. In our uh, models, we have inputs. Uh, as a virtual environment that may parallel to the farm environment in the digital twin model. We have the characteristics of the, of the fish. We build the model. Uh, model involves just the fish living in the environment, how it feeds, make decision, interact with other fish in the same environment, so on. And we have output. The output is uh, the behavior of the fish, complex cell behavior, behavior patterns, and also the level of stress, level of welfare, and the, such important practical uh, measures like growth and energetics of the fish. Uh, using this digital laboratory, we hope to uh, make a system that is, uh, can work as a decision support system with scenario modeling, so that, for example, in the fish farm, the practitioners can um, run the model, see what, how fish is feeling, if there are some changes in the system or perturbations or unplanned perturbations, uh, what is the response of the fish in terms of growth, behavior, and welfare. It's basically a digital twin approach. Uh, we focus on stress, as I already told you. Stress uh, is a, a wide concept, but the most important characteristic of stress is that it's, uh, it has a link with uncertainty and controllability. If the environment is uncertain and uncontrollable, it results in stress. And uh, the, main, the main approach to stress, in my uh, theoretical approach to stress, is based on the concept of our studies. It's predictive regulation of body functions and animal budget, energy budget, and so on. 
Basically, animal tries to maintain stability of its internal homeostasis by change. Animal is uh, predict always uh, continuously predicting the environment and makes preparation for these predicted uh, uh, future conditions. Some of these preparations can be very costly, and if uh, the model used to predict the future is wrong, then this will result in very big uh, big cost. That is called allostatic load. So prediction is very important for decision making and for stress response. If prediction is wrong, then this results in stress. This uh, diagram represents our very schematically our uh, model. We work at uh, a kind of higher level than neurons work at the level of uh, certain concepts like motivations, emotions, and so on. In the model, we have stimuli that come from the virtual environment and the fish, this collection of uh, feedback loops uh, and equations. Uh, the fish has uh, several so-called survival circuits that uh, are basically motivational systems, the theoretical concept, motivational system like fear, hunger, social, motiv social motivation, and so on. They are activated by the stimuli uh, and compete with one another. And the winning motivation or winning emotion becomes the global organismic state. It's the main subjective state of the fish at this time. And it, can, of course, can change depending on the environment. And this global organic state, the subjective state of the fish, uh, exerts very strong effects on basically everything. It affects behavior, it affects uh, metabolism, and so on. And uh, there are uh, many complex uh, feedback loops uh, that depend on this global organic state. Basically, the subjective state of the fish is represented by this global organic state. The state itself and the strength of the on the dominant motivation, because hunger, for example, can be weak or can be very strong. There is also uh, a prediction component in the model, because the agents, our artificial fish, make decisions based on how they assess uh, the result of their predict predicted actions. For example, the, in this uh, scheme, uh, I show um, how fish de decide which of two food items to eat. One may be a small food item very far away, and another is a big, very close. It's a trivial situation, but it shows how the model is working. And in this situation, the fish is predicting what will be its level of hunger if it eats one or another food item. And then select the behavioral that will result in the minimum level of hunger. In this case, it's big and close food item, of course. It's trivial. And the fish always keep track of the prediction error. The difference, basically, it's a very simple difference between the, what is observed, what uh, what subjective state is observed now, and what was predicted. And so it can keep track of the prediction error. If prediction error is getting uh, bigger and bigger, then it results in stress. It's, uh, the model is quite complex, but this is very simple. I try to be to make a simple outline of the model. And there are some expectations of the model, of our model. And these expectations, they can be basically called predictions because uh, we didn't do much, much of the experiments. And our expectations are usually in line with what is observed in the literature, available, available literature. Uh, our basic expectation of the model and predictions from running simulations is that uh, high prediction error uncertainty is leading to stress. The higher the uncertainty and the higher is the prediction error, the higher the level of uh, motivational stress in the model. If there are several parallel challenges uh, arousing uh, several, uh, several circuits and several motivational or emotional systems, simultaneously, this will make stress even more uh, strong, even stronger. Uh, also, we see that mild uncertainty is likely to increase the hero complexity. But when the prediction error is very strong and the agent is under strong stress, the complexity of its behavior is falling very strongly down. It, it, it makes behavior very uh, rigid and uh, 
very simplistic. We also predict, the model also predicts uh, cognitive bias, ambiguity bias. Uh, but uh, stimulus is difficult to classify, that is ambigu ambiguous, is uh, classified as in line with the current uh, global dynamic state. For example, if it's very hungry, then ambigu ambiguous stimuli will be classified as uh, signals of food. And all these predictions are basically in line with uh, what is observed in the literature on fish and many other animals. But the model is very generic. It can be used in, with fish and also with other animals. And it's basically a framework, not a single model. We can do it, combine the building blocks of, the, of our models differently to represent different species, different systems, different environments, and so on. Um, if you like to learn more about our approach and framework and some results, this is this paper explains uh, something and describes some overview of the framework. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sergey, for that very interesting presentation. I see that we already have a question from the audience, but if it's okay with everybody, we will wait by taking the questions until the short discussion in the end. So thank you very much, uh, Sergey. Up next, we have Christopher Löwal, Technical Manager, Scantrol Deep Vision AS, and Vanita Alken, researcher at the Institute of Marine Research. The stage is yours. Hey, thanks for the introduction. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen here. Okay, do you see the screen? Yeah. Yes, we see your screen. Yeah, good. So, so we've decided to divide our presentation into two pieces. Uh, I will first go a little bit into our system, our subsea camera system, and how it works and how we use the machine learning methods that are developed over at IMR. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about Scantrol, uh, the Scantrol group, as we call it. It consists of three companies, Scantrol, uh, which is a control system and winch control supplier. They do seismic streamer cable control, uh, troll control for fisheries and marine science, and active heme compensation. And then in the same office, we have Deep Vision, which uh, makes embedded systems for marine science and fisheries. We have the fish meter, which is a digital fish measurement board. Uh, and we have two different camera systems, uh, the Deep Vision research version and the Deep Vision fisheries. Then in Spain, we have a company called GVR, Girona Vision Research. Uh, they do classical computer vision and machine learning. Uh, we make embedded software and GUIs. We do subsea imagery processing and also tools for machine learning, like labeling tools, for instance, for speeding up the process of making label data. We also work very closely with IMR. Uh, this is enabled through the SFI CREMAC. Um, CREMAC works uh, towards improving and automating the interpretation of data and imagery for modern broadband acoustics on research vessels and fishing boats by using cruises and experimental field researcher, artificial intelligence, drones and inspection technology. So uh, we work together in CREMAC with a lot of companies um, towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and our main focus at the moment is to make a fisheries version of our system based on the research, research version where we use the data collected from the research version to, to make a system that can catch the valuable fish and then release all undersized fish and also illegal bycatch. So the deep vision stereo camera system is a camera system that is fitted in the troll. Um, this is a 3D model of the fisheries version, which is simply a small stereo camera system fitted to the side wall of the troll. And then we have a selection mechanism at, uh, at behind the system that can sort out uh, different species. And to be able to do this, we need to answer a couple of questions like how many objects are going through the troll? what are these objects and what's the size distribution of these objects and and combining all the answers to all of these question, questions we can automate the process of uh, trolling for both research and fisheries industry so data collection um, label data is quite expensive within our field because we need 
to, to be able to collect ground truth data, we need biologists to label the data. A lot of the species are quite hard to differentiate. So uh, therefore we're trying to uh, improve our images in such a way that uh, the, we need less data to get ac accurate results uh, by using machine learning. And there's a lot of uh, different trades of trade-offs here. Uh, for instance, we need to combine a set of uh, camera settings to get as good images as possible. For instance, if we increase increase the light that is transmitted through to the sensor, we get a, a smaller depth of field. Uh, we can't have too high of an exposure because then we get motion blur, uh, and we can't have too high of a gain. Um, because then we get we also induce more noise. So therefore, we have uh, in our first versions used this large box, as you can see, that is fitted in the troll like a photo studio to, to be able to get um, to be to be able to get enough light to to capture good high quality images. Uh, the later versions we have found that we do not really need as high quality as we first expected, and then we can do a lot more of the analysis on on poorer quality images. But we still have the issue of the differences between different camera systems. And we try to improve our data by uh, calibrating all the camera systems so that images from different systems will look very close uh, to the same. This we do by calibrating the photometric parameters, the intrinsic parameters of the system, and also the extrinsic parameters of the system. This is correcting the lens geometry's effect on the image and also correcting the images so that um, all of the images look the same and they look like, um, uh, like for instance, my hand here in this image uh, holding the color calibration palette looks like it would do in air, even though this is in uh, water. And you also see that we do have some gain here, but uh, this is to, to be able to, to correct all of the images to the correct color space. So now that we have collected all of the data, uh, we need to use, uh, we, we kind of need to use the data in an efficient way uh, to be able to analyze the troll holes uh, within, we have, I think we have 20 minutes, we have set as like a time goal from the deep vision systems comes on board the boat until the data needs to be analyzed. So we have a topside system, uh, which contains uh, a data loader. It downloads the data from the deep vision system as soon as, as it is connected. And then we do some pre-processing, uh, which is the co color calibration and geometrical calibration, as I showed earlier. Then we run some analysis. This analysis is what Bonita will talk about. And then we export the data to our da own database to be able to use for further training. And we also export it to IMR's vessel storage. And uh, then IMR is using a program called LSSS, which takes the image and the XML files and presents this data in a way that is easy to view. So here you can see the, an acoustic image where the gray line here is a deep vision in the water column. And then you can see the, the different colored blobs here containing different species and the amount of uh, fish or the concentration of fish in that area. And now Vanida will present uh, the, the work that is done in the dockers. Uh, hi, can you see my screen? No, not yet. Um, okay. There you go, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I am uh, working at the Institute of Marine Research where we conduct these annual surveys uh, where we monitor the fish population. Uh, to estimate the fish distribution, we would normally typically use uh, acoustic data and troll sampling. With acoustic data, we can identify schools of fish, but it can be difficult to distinguish between species. And uh, with troll sampling, we have the fish distribution, but we don't know exactly where the fish were captured. So with the deep vision images, we can confirm the fish species and obtain information about the time and the depth at which the fish were captured. Uh, so here we have a transect showing stations where we trolled. 
um, so this is an underwater Im uh, image of the deep vision system. And this image below shows the troll profile and the images integrated with the ECOSANDA data. We collect millions of images, so it would be time consuming for humans to sort through all these data. So we wanted to automate this process using machine learning. So uh, we wanted to uh, so auto automatically identify the fish species from the image. So we would be able to color code the troll path like here, for example, we have the, so for example, if we had uh, one species, uh, for example, mackerel here, we would have it in green and herring in, in red. Um, so the first task we worked on was an image classification task, so we could predict a label for each image. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this challenge, as always, as Christopher pointed out, was getting enough labeled data to train our algorithm. So we developed uh, this method to augment existing data where we cropped fish, cropped out fish from a set of images and then used them to generate new synthetic images. So we crop uh, images and paste them on an empty background after doing a series of transformation uh, to, the, uh, to the crop. Um, so yeah, uh, so this works quite well. We show here uh, a graph. Um, so this graph shows the test accuracy when we train on different data sets. On the y-axis, we vary the number of fish crops we use per species. And on the x-axis, we vary the size of the data set we generated. Uh, as expected, uh, the more crops we have, the better accuracy we have. So we have more var variability in the data set that we train on. But uh, the size of the data sets also makes a difference. So the more image we generate, the better uh, we uh, better accuracy we get. So the best accuracy we get on uh, on a, a classification task uh, was ninety four percent. And uh, yeah, so that was the first task we worked on. And then we worked on uh, counting and estimating fish distribution. So. Uh, so this image here, we, that was done manually, but we wanted to automatically also count the number of instances of fish per image. So for this, we trained an object detection model uh, where we can not only identify the fish species in the image, but also the number of instances of fish uh, in the image. So we can count the number of fish and then sum, up, sum them up. This is especially useful when we have more than one fish and uh, one, one, one fish species per image. Uh, we used uh, an object detection, uh, so the object detection we use, uh, we use RetinaNet, which is a single shot object, de uh, object detector. Uh, it uses a feature pyramid network, which is able to detect objects at different scales. So in our case, uh, the size of the fish can vary significantly depending on the species. So for example, mesopelagic fish uh, is less than 10 centimeters, whereas uh, pelagic fish are more than twice their size. So this is... Uh, particularly uh, adapted for this kind of model. Uh, we use the same um, method as before to generate images. So this is, which is particularly useful when we want to do object detection, because when we, uh, when we generate images, we also have the position of the fish in the image automatically. And it is particularly tedious to annotate the data because we to draw bounding boxes around each object. So with this method, we obtain a mean average precision of 0.85, and we only used 650 uh, labeled images to train on. And so we published this uh, last year in the ISIS Journal of Marine Science. Um, yeah, so then we have, we used our best model to, to run and, and run, um, so run, run this algorithm on uh, images on, from one troll survey. So this gray line shows the depth and path of the troll co column. Uh, each dot represents fish predictions in, uh, in an image. And the color of the dot indicates the fish species, and the, while the size of the dot represents the number of fish in the image. Uh, below, we have the distribution of the fish species at the corresponding size, uh, times. The histogram shows the fish counts per species summed in 60 second bins. So each bar shows the count per species per minute. Uh, so we see that we have different species come into the troll at different depths and different times of the troll hole. So we have created a system that can automatically analyze millions of uh, underwater images. And uh, yeah, and also to check with the real, uh, real life, um, we uh, compared with catch data. 
Uh, so we compared the total number of fish predictions with the total catch for each trawl station. We can't compare directly because the same fish appears uh, in several consecutive images. So we plotted the log transform of the prediction count for each station and the corresponding catch data and built a si simple li linear regression model. Uh, in panels B to D, we have plotted the individual species. The color of the dot represents the log transform sum of other species of the catch from that station. So we see that the prediction count for a species tends to be higher when the catch for other species are high. Uh, but if we sum up all the species and the sum all the counts, uh, we see that the correlation between the prediction and the catch is quite high. So our plan now is to use this model on future surveys and eventually use an open cod end uh, every other hole so we don't need to use to catch as much fish for our assessment. Yeah, thank you. So that's me. Thank you very much, Lanita. Um, uh, next, we have, um, yeah, sorry. Next, or finally, we have John Costantino, co-founder of Manolina Aqua. Um, I also would just take the opportunity to encourage everybody in the audience, if you do have questions, please do not hesitate to ask them either using the Q&A function or using the, the chat. We, we will be uh, taking questions in the panel debate afterwards. And with that, John, the virtual stage is yours. Perfect. Can you hear me and see the screen? Yes. Thank you. Just to fix this real quick. Okay. Perfect. Um, sorry about that. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. We're very happy that we got to do an event, even if it did end up being virtually. It's still nice to be in front of everybody and get to talk a little bit about Madeline. Um, I am John. I'm the co-founder and CTO. Uh, and what Madeline is, is it's a digital toolbox to help improve fish health. Um, kind of hit on three things today. I'll give a brief intro to Madeline. Um, I'll explain a little bit about what we do, and then we'll talk more about AI and how Madeline's using it to make an impact on aquaculture, as well as some other things that are going on. Um, so yeah, we'll jump right in. Uh, a little bit about our story. Uh, I'd find it very unique. Maybe that's biased to say, but we didn't know each other before we started this company. Uh, we, did, we did meet each other on fin.no, but the American version, which is Craigslist. Uh, I was looking for a roommate in DC. We were both government contractors. And like any stereotypical millennial who just gets a job that makes money, they think it's cool to eat raw oysters. So we ended up going on a trip uh, down to Virginia Beach to eat oysters at a restaurant. Um, while we were down there, we ended up uh, talking to the waiter and we asked, uh, can we go and check out the farm and explore it? So they took us out on the boats and they let us look at how they flip oysters and started talking about all their trials, tribulations, and woes. Uh, and a lot of the issues came down to there's specific events that occur. There's freeze events, there are mortality events, there are specific algae blooms that happen within this waterway. Uh, and they wanna be able to predict it. So we were both computer scientists working with the government at the time, uh, that got us excited. So we said, yeah, we're gonna just come down on the weekend, work for free and we'll build you some application to predict this stuff. Um, we were naive because when we got down there, we had no data to work with. Um, they didn't collect anything other than what's on a whiteboard or handwritten journal logs. Uh, and very, very shortly after we got down there on our first trip, we realized we needed to scale back that grandiose vision of predicting everything under the sun to something more realistic, which was building an inventory management system. So much less sexy. Um, after running that for about a year and collecting a good bit of data and starting to do some cool things with anomaly detection, we started looking at other industries because we wanted to understand how some of these different aquaculture industries are managing their data, how they're understanding disease, how they're properly assessing risk. Um, we went to some seafood conferences and through a series of connections and a lot of whispers or maybe yells, uh, the, we heard Norway quite a bit. You got to come check out Norway. You got to go and see this place. So. 
Uh, late 2017, in the middle of December, we flew out here for a four-day crash course in the industry. Um, we actually met with some folks at NC Seafood um, who gave us the rundown, and uh, we heard about parasites like sea lice, and that was kind of the big thing. Sea lice and treatments are a big problem here. We left that trip, and three weeks later, we quit our jobs, sold all our possessions, uh, drove up to JFK Airport, uh, and left. And four years later, I'm still here. So um, when we got here, we were we had our heads a little bit onto the water, I think would be the best way to put it. Um, we knew of the problem, but what we didn't know was how do we take that problem and actually apply a solution in practice? So we did the only thing we knew how to do, which was get in a car and drive up the coast of Norway, which is some of the pictures you see here, um, and visit farms and camp along the way. Uh, and from that trip, we heard all similar stories. Um, we heard uh, disease is an issue. We heard that there's mortality events and there's deprivation in oxygen, but there's no real explanation understanding as to why. Um, we were pretty confident that we can solve the problem, but something that was lingering throughout the entire car ride home was, it's a big challenge to tackle. This is an advanced industry with a lot of different data systems and it's gonna require a team, um, which brings me to my next slide. Um, this is the team that we currently have now, um, and I'm super grateful for them because they have been a very big help um, along the way, and we're the, the only reason why we've gotten to anywhere that we came close to today. Um, we span backgrounds from government consulting to fighting fires to uh, working in the aquaculture industry directly to the agriculture industry, but the one commonality across all of us is that we have worked with data in one way or another. Um, what we didn't expect was getting into aquaculture data. Uh, it's a very challenging industry. Um, on the right, you see tons of different platforms that they have, and that's the original whiteboard on the bottom left there of, of what the oyster farms were using. Um, aquaculture has three problems with their data. Uh, number one is that it's very siloed. Uh, there is a system for everything. Every sensor has its own system. Every operational uh, ERP system has, you know, where they track their fish inventory and their treatments and everything they're doing. It's all their own system. Um, so step one is figuring out how to get that in place. Uh, the second one is gut feeling. Biologists, any fish health biologist that's on these farms, they know when their fish are sick. Uh, they're dealing with livestock or doing living things. So they can see when they're sick. But what's really hard is taking somebody who has all that experience and then replicating that in numbers, a way to quantify that. Because when those people leave, that knowledge is gone. Um, and then number three is that we're in the water and we're dealing with living things. So it's, it's super dimensional. This data has tons and tons of different ways that it could be intertwined or uh, correlate with each other. So um, it's, it's a complex problem. So we decided that we needed to take some sort of incremental approach to get us to that end goal of how do we properly assess risk on aquaculture. Um, so here's how it works. We wrote some custom code to tie into a lot of the production systems, and some of these are very familiar faces uh, up there. Um, but uh, we pull in from these data silos, and we aggregate them in Madeline. Uh, once it gets into that aggregated data warehouse, as we say, we do a couple things. Um, we take the data and we clean it. Um, and then we, we don't split the data, but we do two separate things then. We have this anonymization process that we take, anonymize the data, and then feed it into our forecasts and our industry benchmarks. And then we take the cleaned raw data that's private to a farmer, and we provide that in a platform as a way to just look at standardized, democratized graphs um, across the entire organization. The real goal of doing this for us is aquaculture, from what we've seen globally, is a very putting out fire situation. You're always reacting to something. Um, so we wanted to be able to start shifting that mindset into something a little more preventative. And in order to do that, you kind of have to follow the steps that I laid out before. Um, getting things into a centralized or standardized location allows for you to align communications across your entire organization. So. There is no one-off Excels. People still have them, they still use them, but there is no one-off Excel where, um, you know, uh, someone who's been there for 20 years decides that they're gonna leave and that Excel is gone as well. And now all that knowledge has gone. Uh, it also allows for folks who might not be the most technologically advanced, but understand fish health to a degree that no one else does, 
to validate and, and prove to their bosses when they want to make decisions and, and have actual numbers to back it up. Um, once that stuff's standardized and centralized, you can do the other things on this list. I mean, you can alert on deviations because it's all coming in one place. So you can lay out, you know, algorithms that are scanning your, your, your records within uh, the database constantly. Um, you can look and understand what's going on with your losses by benchmarking performance of products and trying to assess how many treatments you've done and the frequency of stress on that fish. Uh, uh, all of these things line up to that last bullet point, which is you're really looking to know sooner when a fish is at risk and it requires the above in order to do that. Um, and here's a, a real world example. It's a case study that we just published. Um, in 2021, we worked with one of our customers, Lingalox. Uh, they wanted to put a data strategy in their company. Um, their goal was to just have usage in the platform and have them using data. There was no definitive, it wasn't about risk models or anything. It was just using a platform and using that to back up decisions. So anytime that they made a decision, they had to back it up with data. They used our platform 70% of the year. And in that 70%, they saw these metrics that you see on the screen, a 41% reduction in mortality, which is fantastic. And when you compare that to their production zones of how they did from a lice management, they did very good. So you combine an aggressive treatment strategy with, um, a reduction in mortality that's actually unheard of because not unheard of, but it's very hard to do because treatments are such a big indicator of stress on the fish and stress leads to weaker fish, which leads to mortality. So it's really cool to see this and we were super excited, um, but I think this is kind of the first or the precursor to, to where we're going. Um, it was talked about a little bit before with the fish's digital twin or the digital fish. Um, I, uh, Always hesitate to use buzzwords, but I think digital twin is pretty fitting in this case. Um, when you look at the left column here, there's quite a few things that are contributing factors to understanding when a farm is going to have a problem uh, and, and really simulating that farm. Uh, you have your environment, you have the way that the fish and the people who work on the farm behave and do things, uh, where the fish came from, the vaccinations, the genetics of the fish, the, the, the eggs that it came from the diseases that it incurs, the boat traffic nearby. And of course you have to take all that and then span it out again to the nearby activity because um, what's going on in the water transfers from farm to farm to farm with specific pathogens and with specific issues. So uh, you need to track all these different metrics which probably have thousands of metrics underneath it um, to just make a simple prediction of are you gonna get PD or not within the next week. Um, so from these metrics on the left side and all their underlying ones, there's uh, the right side that is kind of the output. Um, so we can take the metrics and the feature sets that are generated from that left side to cluster farms operationally um, to understand treatment patterns of a specific farm may align with another farm that's not geographically located in the same place, but they do perform in similar aspects. Um, you can take those clustering and you can layer that to do benchmarking on top. Uh, how is your farm performing compared to other farms? Um, if I change my product, how can I, uh, what can I expect out of that product? If I want to use a different feed, will it actually improve my growth? Has it improved growth on other farms? Um, anomaly detection, estimations, recommendation engines, all this stuff, it all ties back to tying or, or getting data into a single place and then keeping it clean, consistent and standardized. Um, so. That's the goal, and I think that there's uh, aquaculture is a very interesting space because I think there is a ton of opportunity, and uh, you're seeing new things crop up that are creating new data points every single day. But it's the only aquaculture industry in the world that has a massive amount of existing data points already. So I think there's a ton of opportunity here, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to be able to talk about it. So. Thanks again today for allowing me to present, and uh, I'm looking forward to the Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much, John. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Nina Stangeland, Managing Director at NCEC Food Innovation, who will moderate the short uh, discussion between our invited speakers. I would also like to now to invite all the speakers to turn on your camera. Nina, can you hear and see us? Sorry, we I can't hear you for some reason.
Now you're on mute. Can't hear you now either. Technical break. We will be right back. It seems that Nina is having trouble with her microphone. In the meantime, everybody in the audience, if you do have any questions that you're burning in with, please write them out in the chat and we'll make sure that they are directed to the right person in the, in the panel. Still cannot hear you, Nina, sorry. Cannot hear you. Oh, we're getting help. In the meantime, I could also take and introduce Jarl Giske, who is now also um, entered into the conversation. He is a professor at the University uh, in Bergen, the same department as Sergei. Welcome, Jarl Giske. Thank you. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Wow, my colleague is much more advanced than me. I'm so sorry, guys. And, and, uh, my biggest apologies and the uh, embarrassment in front of you all. So, yes, anyway, thank you so much for uh, all the great presentation. And I fully agree with John uh, by saying that uh, it's a ton of uh, opportunities, especially in the aquaculture industry, but also in the seafood industry in regards to uh, AI and uh, fishing and uh, wild catch also. So. Uh, Nice to have this uh, discussion here with all these great uh, people. But first of all, I just want to um, uh, comment uh, and uh, ask some questions there in the chat. And I just encourage you all to uh, participate because uh, this is a dialogue and uh, it's much more fun if we, we all in, uh, interact uh, in the session. So uh, I see the first question here is goes to Wade and Christopher at uh, Scantrol Deep uh, Vision, and um, they say, how will the system help to provide with them trawlers to capture other species when uh, we do not want to catch? I'm sorry, I don't think I understood the question. Can you repeat, please? Uh, they ask, uh, how could the system that you have uh, developed uh, uh, help you to reduce the unwanted catch in the system? Yeah, so at the moment, we are doing all of the analysis after the system is taken on board, but we plan to shift all of the uh, classification and length measurement down to the subsea unit itself. And then we have a mechanical device fitted in the troll itself that can sort fish out of the troll if it's unwanted catch. So you can preset the camera to, for instance, do not catch any macro. And then all of the macro will be sorted out through a hatch and all of the wanted species will be catched in the troll, uh, in the cod end, as it's called, the, the large bag on the end of the troll. Yes, um, and it's uh, actually uh, how you have uh, been developed this, this is all about the uh, visionizing uh, um, picture identifications of the species. Uh, so it's uh, very interesting to see, but, but some of the questions there also goes to uh, how you can um, uh, predict to say what kind of place you should catch uh, and uh, use your uh, trawl in. And, uh, do you uh, have uh, started uh, the thought of how you can use this system also to pre uh, prevent and predict where to go? Yes, um, we have plans. Uh, not, nothing of this is confirmed yet, but we do want to expand the system in such a way that uh, different fishermen can share the information that they got between them in a mapping system where you can see where different species have been catched and when they have been catched. If they are uh, willing to share this information, they can decide to share it between them so that they can 
uh, choose not to go in an area where there is a lot of fish that shouldn't be catch because uh, if a lot of uh, one of the forbidden species is catch then they can close down an entire fishing area so this way they can avoid these species by not going to the areas by sharing the information collected by the division system mm. But, but have you also done any analysis on, of course you have, but uh, in what kind of uh, size, because this uh, this will probably depend on the size of the fishing vessels uh, in who will be the end uh, consumer of the systems there. Well, we, we target uh, we target really the entire fleet because we can use the system in very small trolls as well as in multiple trolls in in uh, when you use uh, multiple trolls in parallel, for instance, you can simply just fit multiple systems. So uh, yeah, we, we target all the small boats and the larger uh, factory vessels as well. Good. Um, and I also see, um, I'm just taking up the questions first and we can interact, but, uh, but just uh, add uh, your uh, hand, raise your hand. I know there's a lot of talent that uh, people around here that probably could comment also the discussion. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a question for Sergey, and it's uh, in regards to the digital uh, library. Uh, they wonder how do we know if the model is true representation of fish in terms of their state? Could you comment that, uh, Sergey? Uh, yes, um, of course, uh, we can do experiments uh, the hair experiments, uh, feeding experiments, and so on, uh, cognitive uh, experiments, learning experiments, it's a standard approach. We mo make a model and model makes prediction. We then see how predictions uh, are accounted by the model is a, a prediction error. Then in this case, the model is challenged with the absorbed data. <clears throat> and then if there is some discrepancies or differences, we change model, depending on um, uh, theoretical knowledge or change parameters of the model and then do other predictions and then this is a loop repeated. I see. And, and can, you, uh, can you also comment uh, if there are other parameters than uh, to judge fish stress than what you talked about? Uh, so far, we mostly focus on the stress and the recognition and decision making. But uh, yes, there are global parameters uh, for giant fish stress, uh, for example, the level of appetite. And it's very easy to measure, and it's one of the outputs of the model. <clears throat> oh, here is uh, Jarl Jeskep. Excuse me for interrupting, but uh, the title of Sergei's talk was uh, a report from the inside. And yes. usually uh, the uh, assessment of stress of fish is done from the outside. So uh, uh, it's a very different approach. You say something about the water quality or you say something about uh, how the fish behave or you say something about the mortality. So you kind of assess the situation by observing parameters from the inside. But this model can kind of complement the outside observations by trying to understand how it is to be a fish from the inside. Absolutely, and it's a good uh, uh, um, comment to, uh, to specify the question. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, there's a question for you, uh, John, also here. Um, where do we stand uh, in using I, uh, IA to find different characteristics using your prediction system? Which area is good where we are lagging behind? Is that in response to, is there any clarifying information? Is it in response to <laughs> where the farm sits or is it more so where within a production specific issues or having, or is there no clarifying information? Uh, no, it's uh, Santos who has asked the question. I just don't want, uh, if you want to comment um, uh, by, um, uh, by your voice, uh, Santos, you are welcome to. I can also just answer both of those if, if it's easier. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was we, silent, so uh, you could just uh, answer as uh, you prefer. Yeah. I mean, so we're looking specifically at the, the way that they're producing. Um, we have been trying to utilize benchmarks on performance to understand 
where does the farm have the most room for improvement? But we've been really approaching it from a financing perspective because there's new financing models that are out there that um, they're looking to deploy capital on and, and most of those don't have real well-defined sets. Uh, I, we have not done much in terms of surveying the areas to assess uh, where the best place for a farm is to put. Um, so if that was the question, no, we haven't really done much of that. And the reason being is that moving a farm usually doesn't happen all that often. Um, and, and most of the impact can be made on the actual operations itself. Uh, so yeah, but if there's any more clarifying information or if I didn't answer the question, feel free to comment again and I'd be more than happy to answer. Yes, that's uh, if that Santos has raised his hand. I can allow him to talk so we can specify his question if you want. Perfect. Hi, Santosh, can you hear us? Hello. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So my question was specifically to understand, like, uh, he has uh, uh, put up a system, uh, integrated system to assess or predict different characteristics, for example, behavior of the fish or probably uh, count of the lysis or something else. So uh, I understand that um, uh, it is so difficult to understand even human behavior. So when it comes to fish, uh, I don't know where, where do we stand, for example, or maybe in some areas like in uh, when we come to detection of lysis, I guess many companies have uh, uh, come up and they are able to do it very well. So that was specifically my question. In which area uh, we are good or a lot of res good results we have obtained and uh, where we, uh, which area is something maybe some future AI researchers can focus on? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. Thank you for clarifying, I appreciate it. Um, I think at the end of the day, there is, there is a lot of different aspects of fish health, but they all boil down to one thing and it's really mortality events. Um, if you get a disease, that disease leads to more stress and that typically leads to more mortality. And so we're looking at it from the financing and the risk perspective, like insurance. Um, insurers right now, it's like how they set policy in Norway. They just say, PO3, you have this rice, like lice regulation, PO4, you have this one. It's a very broadly defined bucket. So when we're looking at things, we're trying to identify fish health problems like mass mortality events or specific diseases like PD, um, and then utilize that to actually get to the answer. So like a more, a more uh, fine-tuned approach to clustering farms. It would be the best way to say it. Uh, that's what we're going after. I think in terms of areas where we have decent predictions, I think uh, IMR has done a decent job at doing uh, lice larva predictions. Um, so they understand where lice is in the water up to two meters. And I knew they use a collection of models to do so. Um, I know we have had decent results with our PD models. Um, they but they do vary very often. So, so as the year goes on and more productions happen, things change very quickly in the water. So what we recognize is if we don't retrain that model consistently, the actual performance ends up not being that great in the long run. So uh, yeah, I think it's a challenging space. And to be honest, the, the, nothing is perfect right now and nothing is, is 100%, but there's some decent spaces. If, if I had to put my money in one place of where to focus next though, it's predicting and understanding where mass mortality events are gonna be as a result of environment or operational procedure. That would be my bet, but yeah. And I totally agree, John, because it's a lot of money involved when the fish get sick. And it's also a lot of money that you can save if you would uh, uh, reduce the mortality on your um, farms and from your uh, uh, biomass so uh, absolutely uh, agree to predict and it's one of the most challenging uh, uh, areas in the industry especially in the aquaculture industry because we have uh, unfortunately uh, a lot of mortality and we need to um, to see how we can use different technology, different insights uh, in combination to actually attract the problem uh, from uh, different angles. And it's, uh, it's a lot we can do with data because we have a lot of data and we can get, generate more data if we do it uh, the correct 
a correct way, but it's also, um, I would say it's, uh, uh, it's uh, under development, how we can in this industry, especially in the aquaculture industry, use data both to predict and to transform uh, the way we are doing farming uh, at sea in regards to uh, different species. So um, uh, it's a very uh, inspiring and also a learning full period of time. Uh, Sergey. Yes, I have a small note on mortality. Mortality is a very late uh, symptom. It's already very late if fish start to die. And our ambition is to develop uh, models of uh, internal state of the fish, uh, the, how fish actually feel about one uh, themselves, to make uh, pre early predictions of the uh, development stress yeah. well before mortality is occurring or well before appetite problems and other similar problems are starting to develop. Early prediction is very important uh, in this. Absolutely, and it's a higher interest of uh, taking care of, of course, uh, it, 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 uh, I'm not, um, my comment uh, in the, uh, before you talk now was not to, to reduce the focus on uh, welfare and uh, stress for the fish, because that's, uh, of course, uh, if you can uh, do something there, it will also prevent the mortality, uh, John, and also, of course, uh, improve the welfare of the fish, uh, what, uh, where the focus is a lot in the industry. John? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to clarify again. I wasn't doing the same thing. As I was not trying to diminish the fact of preventative measures because, like I said, we do focus on how we assess the, the treatment effectiveness and when is the best time to treat, what is the stress of that fish up until that point. But for us, the main thing we focus on and why it's more important for mortalities for us is when they're doing risk assessments of how they're going to ensure the aquaculture industry in Norway, they need to understand where those mortalities may happen and why they may happen. So being aware of that is more important. So it's less about predicting in real time in that specific scenario, but uh, I think insurance is where most of the money lays um, from, a, from an opportunity perspective right now, because such a large majority of aquaculture is uninsured globally. 93% um, is uninsured. So that's more what I was focusing on, but yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, John. Um, uh, uh, Jarl, Giske, you have been in this uh, industry and have a uh, long experience and a lot of knowledge. Where do you see the uh, biggest potential in, the, in regards to the artificial intelligence that we are talking about uh, within uh, uh, the industry here? Oh, that was a, was a big question. Uh, but uh, uh, I think we're just seeing the beginning of uh, many different uh, ways of using uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and, uh, and all these uh, technologies. Uh, so so one, one thing is uh, uh, to um, kind of making this overall almost statistical perspective of what is what is going, where is it going to burn next or what can we do like, like this? The other is to wor work closely on what is going to happen, what is actually happening within an aquaculture pan or within a, a ROS system to, to understand uh, from, uh, let's say, um, video analysis, uh, what is going there to, to, uh, to kind of uh, monitor the system so that uh, uh, different kinds of monitoring can um, be used to uh, also in, in the preventing uh, as you can say that uh, we have some uh, red flags coming up or almost red flags coming up and and then uh, and there I think also that this combination of uh, models for understanding could be uh, very important uh, to combine with uh, these uh, observation systems so that you can eventually, you don't need the models for understanding because you have trained the observation systems to, uh, to, to, con to contain that sort of information. But uh, for a while, I think we need several perspectives at the same time. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and uh, yes, I'm sorry, a uh, big question, but you are a man for big questions though. So that, that's, uh, I know you are up for it. Um, 
Uh, and also, I just want to comment that uh, in, in the industry and in the NC cluster innovation that, that we work, we, we kind of uh, distinguish between digitalization that will be, in, in our terms, uh, collecting and sharing of data in new ways, and the more digital transformation that we're talking about in this context where we are using analysis and uh, predictions in how to both transform the uh, business models and using data as a new uh, solutions and incomes uh, for products in the uh, coming years, um, but also for uh, predictions. Uh, so there's a lot of digitalization, I would say, in this industry, and it's some steps for, uh, also to integrate what uh, um, what uh, as the uh, Manolin and uh, Scantrol Deep Vision are using uh, artificial intelligence and how, how new methods can uh, can be used in the industry. But I, I want to uh, um, uh, ask you also, Christopher, uh, how do you see the maturity of the technology that you are presenting to your customer because uh, you will be um, you will be uh, uh, you would need to have the customers on board with the, the certainty of this new technology and the certainty of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and the picture um, recognition so so how do you feel that the industry is developing uh, when you talk to customers about your uh, product yeah so uh, we have been in in touch with a couple of pilot customers for our fisheries version and uh, they seem to be very positive uh, a lot of the feedback is very positive and um, in order to kind of make them understand the value of the product, we are also releasing our fisheries version in, in kind of multiple steps. So we're first making a version that has quite little artificial intelligence, more of an information system that can help them learn what they're actually seeing on the echograms and on, on the acoustic images they, they collect and what different depths, temperature, temperatures, etc., the different species are catched. Uh, and then uh, help us also to to label data for us so that we can make algorithms specifically 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 excuse me for the different uses that they want so so one of the things that uh, we see that could be a challenge is uh, having so many different classes put into one method and that's why we need to target specific fisheries first we, we're trying to for instance target the the redfish and uh, and haddock fisheries first before going to the southern parts, parts of the globe where there are thousands of more different species than there are in the Norwegian seas. So, um, but yeah, the, the, the feedback we get now is, is absolutely very positive. Um, we, we haven't really seen too much negative feedback except that some are worried that the information contained will be used against them somehow. But uh, of course, this will be handled uh, by different contracts, etc. That uh, they are the owners of the information that they collect on their vessels, etc. So. Yes, and and usually, like my next question would be: Are are, are you seeing acceptance of first movers that actually say that? Uh, I'm uh, not only I'm interested, but I will actually try to use your product because I see see this is, uh, would be uh, beneficial for my company. Uh, yes, uh, we, see, we see now that there are uh, a lot of different fishers that are trying to buy the product already. Uh, they're saying that as soon as you have it ready, we will purchase it from you, which is a positive thing, of course, but uh, uh, it will be interesting to see how they react when they actually get to use it over a period of time. Um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Christopher, uh, because this is kind of the maturity uh, first mover uh, um, period that you have been through, uh, John, and you are a little bit later than uh, um, and more established in the industry in regards to maybe a customer's uh, maturity of uh, and 
of using products like you uh, and services like you present. How do you feel the from my angle, I feel that it's been a, it's been a great um, increase in the maturity of uh, data and interest for data and predictions models and new solutions only the last few years. What will be your take on that? Yeah, I, I think um, I pretty much agree with that. I mean, I, I'm smiling because it's a very similar situation to what we were in. And, and to be honest, you still have pieces of it scattered throughout the industry as well. Um, you, you come in, you offer technology, and you promise a lot, of course, up front because that's how you have to do it, right? Um, and, and what you end up doing is you have to double back, and then you start building something that's much more applicable. Like maybe it is just simple graphs or a simple report. Um, and then you can start throwing the fancy AI and all the good stuff on top of it that all the technical people actually want to work on. Um, but I think the industry is going through a very interesting phase where you're seeing, uh, first you, you said, we don't need technology. That's, that's what the industry was saying. We don't really need it, we have enough. Then it was, well, we have some data, but we need to get that data in order. And, and once it's in order, then we might think about doing these fancy solutions with AI on top of it. Uh, people got here and then they started to realize we actually don't need to wait. We don't need to build our own systems. This is, once we have our data of our own in order, we have our own data warehouse or data lake, we could start trying new things on top of it. And you've seen an explosion in the industry in terms of whether it's startups or if it's what Aqua and Scale are doing as well. They're coming in and they're offering all sorts of new technical solutions on top of things. And the pharmaceutical industry and all of them as well. Everyone's jumping on board. And I think you're seeing a really big technological boom happening again. So hopefully the ride keeps it up. Absolutely. And uh, in our journey, we have been working with a project called uh, Aqua Cloud that is collecting and sharing data. Uh, and uh, just for the, the people that, uh, that don't know what it is, it's just sharing and collecting data across different companies in the industry in uh, um, uh, Aqua uh, platform or a cloud. Um, so it's possible to, to share and collect and uh, um, uh, supply data sets across the industry. But, but what we learned in that lesson since we started in 2000 and 16 is that, of course, uh, what we haven't talked about here, it's, it's difficult to predict and it's difficult to use uh, uh, AI unless you uh, have good data quality. So it's a lot of um, work. You should start on standardization and data quality to actually be sure of the prediction that are being used uh, in the uh, later stage of uh, any service or product in the industry in either it's uh, fisheries or it's aquaculture, it will be important to, to do the boring job of standardization and data quality if you're gonna predict. Uh, and John, uh, uh, you uh, would like to comment, I guess. Yeah, sorry, I just had a question actually. Where, where, do, you think, um, where do you think the standardization happens? Uh, I, I've had a, a very internal dilemma of, does it happen from a governmental regulatory perspective? Um, does it happen from the industry itself and then the want to do it? Or is there a way to kind of uh, let, them, let them run wild and let them not have their standards, but standardize that data in another place? Can you do it in a centralized system? Can you do it through software and technology? Because I think Norway is interesting. You can deploy um, governmental regulations, but try dropping that in the middle of, uh, I don't know, India, where they're doing shrimp farming and they have no idea how much shrimp even goes in the water, or they know it's in the water, but they have no idea how many are dying along the way. Um, can you standardize that at a governmental level, uh, governmental level where there really isn't a government to standardize it on? Um, Yes, I think that's, if I were to answer that, uh, maybe someone else also will, but uh, if I were to answer, it's uh, what is the underlying value here would be incentives. So either it's uh, incentives because you in the end will get uh, better economical uh, profits or you would get better sustainability or you would reduce mortality or whatever it will be, it will be in incentives. And incentives... Uh, <laughs> that I would say would be working best would be if it's, it's more a carrot than it's a slam in the face. Uh, so if we 
could start if it's from the regulation point of view, it's a carrot, or if it's from the industry point of view, it's a carrot, it will be still be incentives uh, to standardize. And uh, uh, from uh, my point of view, it's maybe in Norway, we are in a very good uh, position because we are used to cooperate and uh, the, especially the aquaculture industry and the fishing industry, it's all a cooperative, uh, uh, joint uh, thought when they started fisheries and when they started aquaculture, it was always they were uh, cooperating and sharing knowledge. And also that's the same that we do with uh, academics now, but uh, um, either it would be in India or it would be here. It would be to set good incentives for standardization. And I think that could be from both sides actually. And it depends on how it's put together. At least that's my opinion. Uh, so general uh, answer, but we could uh, discuss that more uh, uh, in detail if, uh, if you want. Jag uh, Giske, uh, comment from you? Yeah, just a comment about this standardization because there's kind of a two sides of a coin here, isn't it? Uh, uh, if you if you standardize uh, it opens an uh, arena for uh, innovation to come in and utilize uh, the, uh, the extra data sets, which are kind of uh, of the same type. But if the standardization can also be a kind of an, an end to innovation, that uh, innovation which uh, should like to have an openness where the standardization has closed the borders, then uh, we have a problem. So standardization should be kind of a soft thing. Yes, and it should, like, I think maybe in digitalization, it would be standardized a solution on how to integrate, but not how the product or the service should be, uh, but how to integrate the data should be like, uh, you don't need uh, several USB sticks for integrated in your uh, PC, you should have like APIs that you can integrate and uh, uh, share data in a standardized way. Um, and I think also in the data quality, especially in the work we've been doing with uh, AquaCloud, we see that it's as more you work with it, as more the different um, farmers will see the uh, positive side of standardization and actually be willing to integrate this on the uh, seaside of the personnel because they see the value of how they can use the better data in the end and then go into predictions as you do uh, John and analysis like you also do when this kind of thing and it would be the same uh, for uh, scan toll and how you could predict uh, in terms of pictures and whatever technology. Okay Sergey. Uh, I, I think uh, standardization is very important because uh, it creates interoperability between different systems and different uh, models and many different things. And uh, but standardization can, of course, uh, hamper uh, innovation. But standardization must be done, of course, uh, sensibly. It should be a set of uh, extensible standards. So there, there is some something like a baseline standard and on top of this different farms or different teams can do more in way and, and more innovative things absolutely and uh, it's a very good uh, point to to have in the end of this uh, friday evening uh, no not evening it's only afternoon <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> But I think we will um, end it by here and I will um, leave the word for um, uh, over to Noah who has hosted it. So um, thank you for good discussion and uh, we'll leave it for you. Thank you, Nina, for dropping by and moderating this very interesting and uh, uh, interesting discussion as well. I would like to thank all the participants again for attending this Noura. Uh, dot startup webinar. It has been incredibly interesting hearing about uh, well, all your various different presentations. There's certainly been <clears throat> much more new information for me, but this is not my area of expertise normally. So it's been incredibly interesting. I would also like to thank all uh, the people in the uh, that are participating watching this webinar, and I would recommend you all to keep a lookout on Nora's webpages for our next extravagant event, wherever that might be. 
and enjoy your Friday and have a good weekend. Thank you.